resume. And I'll just remind Dr. Francis, Dr. Francis, you're still sworn to tell the truth. Yes, thank you. And, yes, and counsel, you may begin. Mr. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Uh, Swan has now joined us, but certainly, um, and so he's, he's camped in and will be listening. Good afternoon, Mr. Swan. All right. Uh, Dr. Francis, I think it can be relatively short this afternoon. I wonder if it would be good enough to turn to page 49 of your uh, report. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Now, you mentioned that there were, um, there was a, you're referring to a petition. Yes, sir. And I didn't count precisely the number of landowners, but broadly about 25, is that fair? It's 24 people named on the petition and 23 of them represent landowners, yes, sir. Right, okay. And uh, all together, as between them, they own you say approximately 100 acres? Yes, that's what they represented in their petition. They claimed to have approximately 100 acres between all of the individuals. And uh, some of the names you mentioned uh, that are in the petition, you subsequently discuss in your report. Um, uh, for example, Mr. Henry Nelms, the very mm -hmm. last one, yeah. He owned about six acres and a rod. Yeah, six acres and one rood approximately. So about six and a quarter acres, I right. believe. Yeah. Right. And uh, do you have any sense how the how much how much the others owned? Were they all roughly in that neighborhood? But six um, acres, or do you know? If, um, I know for some of them, definitively, I can give you an answer for Henry Nelms, for example. Um, Dinah Smith is also connected with J. Bear Smith, so they right. co-share ownership on an eight and a quarter, I guess, maybe eight and a half acre right. property. Um, William Orlando Hillgrove Smith, he's also a co-owner in the same property as Dinah Smith. So, yeah, I was trying to trace out all the names, but I do not have specific ownerships on all the names. The two I can speak definitively for is the Smith family kind of group, Donna Smith, Orlando Smith, Jay Bears, and um, Henry Nouns. Uh, uh. When, when you look at these groups, uh, is there a grouping of people? I mean, how many different groups would the 24 represent? Because you just mentioned two or three were related. Yeah, so, yes, so I if, do. So if we take the related ones as one, for the yes. sake of argument, how many of those relations are there? In terms of, so, so you mean how many separate par parcels of land are there, or are there what types of relationships are there? Because I'm just want a little clarification. Okay. Well, let's start with the number of parcels, separate mm -hmm. parcels. I take that 24. No, no, it's not necessarily 24 no? okay. um, specifically. As I said, um, Ms. Dinah Smith, the 16th name that's listed there, she's related to um, she's related to JBS Smith, who's on the next line. She's also related to William Orlando Hillgrove Smith. Um, I know that. Um, I believe she's related to Nancy Simons as well, too. So that's a kind of group grouping. I believe she's related right. to about seven other six about seven other people that I was able to trace out in the time permitted for the report. Um, if you want to just look at parcels of land out of that group, you have r the Reverend Lord Havard. He's the rector for Hamilton and Smith Parish, the Glebe lands there. He's right. kind of coming, representing as the rector for the parish. He has an interest in the Glebe lands because some of the lands there were kind of Glebe lands or church-related lands. Right. So he was concerned about how that would be transferred and whether or not the church would, I guess, be alienated from the ensuing kind of quit rents or any other types of land-related payments that were, you know, associated with Glebe lands and the ways in which Glebe lands were being managed. So, so he's a holder. The Smith family are a holder. I believe you've got Amanda's group that is a holder. So 
roughly about five maybe parcels of land, four or five parcels of land, as far as I can understand it. But I'd have to dig into that list a bit deeper. So essentially what we have, if, even though there are 25 separate people who mm -hmm. signed, when, yes. we, when you take, when you look at it more closely, mm -hmm. we are really looking at five or six groups. As far as plot, yeah, representative groups of land, roughly, yes. Okay. Now, um, then turning, if you will, to page 58, uh, you mentioned that there is a commencement of the uh, jury process. Yes. And I'm sure I have you electronically, not in paper, so I'm okay. kind of s scrolling on my iPad. And now you mentioned that um, they, that Mr. Walker's home was occupied by, by Mr. Rayner. Yes, shortly now, after the transfer. I, I guess once they had the home on a temporary basis, they put the, uh, who was Rayner? Was he uh, a golf course designer? Yes, he was a golf course designer. He worked for C.B. McDonald and his Task, he was tasked with making the golf course. So he was placed right there on site in the home of former Mrs. C.W.W. W. Walker and her husband and or family, Right. if there were and, others who lived there. And I take that uh, Rayner was from the States. Yes, he was an American gentleman from the right. States. And I guess he was going to go back to the States after he finished designing the course? Um, yes, but the land didn't suddenly return back to Miss Walker, obviously. No, no, it was no, in no. the hands of BW, BDC. No, no, I understand that. But my point is, as far as Rayner was concerned, uh, that was a temporary accommodation for him available, and they just made it available for him. Because he was, um, going, back to, he was going back to the States. Yes, he was here. Yeah, he was in Bermuda temporarily to carry out that work on the golf course. Right, so you need a... And they put him in the home, the former home, of Mr. Walker. Yes, yeah, Mr. and Ms. Walker, yes. Now, is there any diary from Mr. And Mrs. Walker? Say that again, is there any diary? Yeah, uh, do you, did they have a diary? Did they leave some kind of a testament as to the, relating to how the property was purchased and what their history was relating to the purchase? Is no, there any... no, sorry. No, you go ahead. Okay. The record that I hear of about the Walker's sale purchase comes by way of Walker making comments about his sale in the context of B.D. Talbot's jury hearing because right. he's summoned by uh, the Bermuda Development Company to make a comment based on the compulsory purchase of his property right. or their property. And so when you refer to, in the page, the trauma and or frustration that the walkers experienced seeing someone else living in their former home comprised part of an unassessed damage of their removal. When you're speaking of their frustration or trauma, those are your words. Um, that is how I describe it, yes, sir, um, and I describe it based on the evidence of a compulsory purchase, as I think just making reference to something you mentioned before the break. Um, dissatisfaction is part of the process of compulsory purchase. I believe that was your, your reference, counsel. So well, that's correct, building, on that, building on the veracity of that concept, I describe it in that fashion. But Walker was not compulsory purchase, was he? Yes, he would. No, yes, it would. Well, he says, who recently sold and vacated his land. So you say that the hearings become on October 13. And if I read your report, Walker sold prior to uh, the hearings. So I take from that that he was one of those landholders who actually sold his property. He didn't have to be expropriated. Hold on for a moment, sir. Right.
Yes, to your point. To your point, yes. He sold prior to, yes. Right. So, so we'll come back to the point. You characterized his trauma and or frustration. That's your characterization. You didn't get yes, it sir. from him. Thank you. <laughs> now then, uh, if you move to Mr. Nouns, who is the next one you are uh, referring to, and um, he has 6.25 acres, right? Yes. Again, on page 58. And um, he presented a counteroffer. They offered him uh, 56 pounds per acre, mm -hmm. uh, which my math is not that good, but it's about 300 or 400 pounds uh, yeah. altogether. 350, roughly. Yeah, sorry. And he said, no, 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 I want more. I want 5,000. Yeah. So, um, and there was a negotiation back and forth, whether he would get his 5,000 or not. And eventually, uh, was there a jury process for him that settled the price? Yes, as far as I believe. But I lose track of all the records of Mr. Nelms, but I believe it was a jury process for his. So you, his. so you don't know how much he received at the end of the day? No, I do not know his final sale price, no, sir. Right. Then we come to Mr. Smith, and he is offered 450 pounds mm -hmm. per acre. No, not per acre. He's offered 400 for the whole lot. pounds for the whole lot. Yes, sir. Right, sorry. And uh, now, have you been able to compare the Smith land with the Nelms land? Because there's a bit of a difference in price, roughly yes, 100 there pounds. Yes, uh, there is. Was it a better piece of property, or do you know? No, I do not have a description to say um, whether or not it was based on, you know, the quality of the land. I, I do not know the, the distinction between those two pieces. But I take you would accept that it may have been the quality of the land or the activities on the land that accounted for the additional money. Yes, those are, those are possibilities. Right. Then we come to a Mr. O'Connor. Mm -hmm. I love that name, Thaddeus. I've never, I haven't seen that for a lot of years, and I can't pronounce it. Um, and Mr. O'Connor was um, oh, had a quarter of an acre. Do you know how much he received? Um, on a different, his case came back up as being listed for jury settlement. In another list I found, I right. do, again, like Nelms, I see him listed to be um, to be part in this jury process, but I do not find, I did not find the um, recover his final sale price. Right. No. So again, we don't know. And, and, and I take, in his case, there was another factor, namely the activity on the land that he yeah. wanted to compensate it for as well. Yeah. And I take from your paper that was indeed one of the factors that the uh, commissioners took into account and ultimately the jury took into account as to how the land was used. Um, yes, but again, too, I think something I presented on yesterday, Council, um, the standard by which that's done, you know, while I agree that that's a valid consideration for something they may okay. have done, what I did not find, what's been absent or in terms of my historical searches and through the assistance of the Bermuda Archive with the Bermuda Development Company's records, and I looked at their general purpose papers, one through five, and they have folders of this and whatnot, to kind of give you where yes. I'm looking, you know, to contextualize my comment. I had not found a strict set of guidelines whereby they say, well, when you assess the land, here are the factors you must take into account. You must take into account whether or not it has arable land whether or not using your taxonomy, taxonomy you mentioned this morning, whether or not the person has a business on it, how many houses. So it's a wide kind of latitude of variance with these assessments that I find. So to your point, in a generic sense, yes, but in terms of the specifics of how that is calculated, what we use, um, just to talk a historical term since we're you know, using my historical expertise, 
there's a term we use um, talking about archival silences, right? And right. just the ways in which certain elements of how the human experience actually transpires, but it is not recorded in a uh, in necessarily a, a colonial file that says this is the file to take note of counsel's reactions to Dr. Francis, and this is the file to take into account something else, right? So in the context of these um, compulsory purchases, the jurors, as well as the BDC commissioners, those three men who were appointed right. to the kind of commission to oversee this process, they seem to have a wide latitude, right? There are some broad guidelines, but they seem to have some wide latitude. So to your point, yes, I'm sure they took into account what was on the land, but what value that was given, it's difficult for us to say. It seems to be a historical silence on how they do that. All we can do is track certain cases where we see some inerrancies in it. And I point to the case of um, B.D. Tolbert, when his land, he goes through we'll the jury process, we'll he lists a number of factors on that, and that don't seem to be taken into account in the same manner. So and it's we'll interesting to observe. Right, we'll come to it. But just again, when we speak of archival silences, um, just so that I understand, I'm not a historian, I'm just a country lawyer, you see. And um, uh, is it because it was 100 years ago and it may be that the archival material is now missing? Or is it because they simply didn't record it, didn't find it necessary? Or, uh, or did you find something where actually there is archival material which directs them as to having a broad discretion? I mean, yes. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. Okay. No, no. Please, you're going to answer, so I'll let you answer. Yeah. Um, there are some. They have directive, right? They have directive to make assessment. They have directive to select a jury and a process by which to select a jury to adjudicate these matters. So they have a process, right? right? That's kind of marked out. How they go about their process is left a lot of latitude to the commissioners, right? And then also to this point about historical silences. Historical silences, it's really a term that's coined by a, he's a historical anthropologist by the name of Michel Rotruyo. Michel Rotruyo in his book, um, history and power. He talks about historical silences and the production of the archive. In this process that we're going through right now, we are privileging, and in the context of my report, right. I attempted to privilege the archive, meaning the formal collection of colonial documents and or business documents as found in the Bermuda National Archive, as well as found in a little bit, the stuff that I was able to gather from the TNA, the National Archive right. overseas in UK, as well as university collections within the United States. That's what I privileged in this 91-page report that I prepared for the commission. However, what Truyo would say is the very production of those documents in the historical moment that they are produced, for, this, for example, in 1920, is a process of power. So we have to think about who's in charge, what gender categories are in charge, what class categories are in charge, what racial categories are in charge, what political parties are in charge, and what information they privilege to be recorded, right? Because as we even know, every entity is not necessarily recorded, and some regimes prefer some types of forms of recording, i.e., for example, to your point, some might prefer the agricultural product, and they say very little about the people who live on the land. Others give you deep description about the people who live on the land and very slim description about the agricultural product, just to make a point. Therefore, when we talk about agricultural, not agriculture, archival and historical silences in an archive, we're thinking about the ways in which power, who's in power and who's not in power, affects what is actually being recorded. You know, so that's kind of how I frame those comments. And I frame those comments not as fact, but just as, you know, hey, it's possible that these folks might have had trauma in the context of thinking about this sale, even though they negotiated to it, was thrust upon them. It, we have no record to say that they had some premeditation to sell their land, right? So we have to consider both sides of it. And while your question might have privileged the fact that they gladly sold their land, we also must consider the counterpoint in order to just have a kind of broad historical understanding of what actually takes place. Well, uh, Professor, thank you for that lecture, but 
I'm more interested in facts at this moment. So I just I... explained to you how facts are created contextually, sir. So it's not to dispute no. you. So please, no. please, counsel, please. No, we I'm... are speaking factually, and my and the document I prepared for the cops for the commission is factual. No, no, so, no, I'm so, grateful. So I appreciate, yeah. So no, appreciate I'm... it, but but please, mind. No, mind. I, I'm, I'm grateful for the learning, but still my question remains for sure. whatever reason. Here we are a hundred years later. We were not alive, at least I wasn't, and I don't think you were, uh, in 1920. Um, and um, so, therefore, to the extent there is a silence as to the process, do we, do we have to conclude necessarily that there were no directives as to how to assess the land? I mean, we say that it appears they had a broad latitude. But, but do we know for sure whether those records were lost, whether or not uh, uh, they, were, they were given oral instructions that were not memorialized, or as you say, they were simply told, look, do what you want. You've got a broad discretion. Do we know? As I pointed to with the report when I described the Bermuda Development Company Act, I want to let me just reference a specific page, if you don't mind, um, in terms of the commissioners, right? Um, in the section just prior to the section you mentioned, right? In where is it? Yeah, and when the information I share on pages 56 and 57, right, I point to the document itself, the Bermuda Development Company Act, where I reference the selection of these individuals, right? Francis Goodwin Goslin is the BDC secretary. In other words, he's the chief administrator. We can track him all the way back to November 1919. 56 and 57 is what I'm talking about. Um, 57 in particular, sorry, page 57. Governor Wilcox appoints the following men as commissioners, right? Um, if we reference back to the actual act itself, the Bermuda Development Company Act Number 2, it does speak to what their various responsibilities are. So to your point, to the question or the statement you made, you know, there you go, just do whatever. No, it wasn't as loose as that. However, they had parameters. But what I'm saying is in the instances that we see the jury actually carrying out its work, we see variance between one evaluation and the next, and that variance either was not recorded or that variance, the specifics which guided that variance, was not described. Even speaking to your point, could have been given orally and not recorded. To my point about historical silences, yes? Right. This idea whereby you have space, and it's not, not to say that it's not information that's being exchanged. It is just we don't have a record of that to see that definitively. And just like you're making a point based on that, likewise, I made a point of saying, you know, hey, there seems to be some space here that's unexplained, sir. That's and unexplained. I understand that. But at the end of the day, uh, like I say as a, not a historian, my short answer would be, for whatever reason, I don't know the answer. Fair? Say that again? So that's your I response? Or I, well, I, 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 I contextualize I'm it putting in my, it, in my, it, in no, my report on page 57 and the previous page. No, 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 no. But what I'm saying that based on what you just said, when we come to a hundred years later, because of that historical silence, for whatever reason, our answer has to be we do not know what instructions, what specific instructions were they given. We do know what their purview was, right? Broadly. But when we have to say what specific instructions, we just kind of got to narrow that in again, too. Right. Or like I said, when I when I looked at the case with, um, the, yes, the parliamentarian, Hastings Autobrius, T.H.H. Autobrius, when 
his case comes up. He makes a speculative assessment about his land, right? He has this 40 acres and he brings in an engineer who yes. says, well, this will be an excellent castle. Harbor would be an excellent port. So based on this, I'm valuing my land to be X, right? And Appleby, Reginald W. Appleby, who's the, the commissioner of, or the chair of the commission, who's actually um, Gosling's brother-in-law, interestingly enough, married to Gosling's sister. <laughs> but Appleby instructs them to, you know, well, you know, it's okay. You can kind of bear in mind what these guys are saying. Meanwhile, in a different case, he says, well, you know, I've got to warn you against people's, you know, verbal assessments of what their land produces. So it's, it's, that's what I'm talking about as far as which speaks to an actual, ex, an actual example of how this difference might play out, right? So it's not just a, okay, it's an open difference. It's a difference which actually has material consequences in the way they carry out their work. I understand that, Dr. Francis, but my question was much more simple. Were these folk given specific instructions to your knowledge? Yes, how, in the Bermuda Development Company Act. Yes, they have a broad, purview. Broadly, but did they give, were they given a broad discretion or was their discretion narrowed by way of instructions as to how to assess the land? We do not see a record for their specific right. land plot to land plot case of doing that. We do not see a record for that. They have directives out of the Bermuda Development Company Act number two, but we do not see a directive to say, when you go and assess Mr. Tolbert's land, assess no, no. it in this fashion, when you go and assess this, uh, Mr. Otterbridge's land, go and assess it in this Clearly. fashion. I do not see a list like that. But is there a list, for example, when you find agricultural land belonging to category three, this is how you assess it. When you find an ongoing business, this is how you assess it. When you find, do you, you are to determine the best use of the land for the purposes of assessment. Do we find that? Do we find that you have to compare uh, adjoining properties for the purpose of establishing value? In other words, I'm not speaking of specific pieces of property. I'm asking you whether or not you know whether or not there were destruction, uh, instructions to that level of granularity. We do not see a record of that level of granularity. That seems to be left to the discretion of the commissioners and or the jury. Yeah, but my point and the jury's decision oftentimes is influenced by a directive from the commissioners, for example, as in those two cases I mentioned. Right. But, but when you say we don't see it, is it because we are confident that none existed or simply it's in the wash of history. Um, I don't know. What, what do you mean by any wash of history? Just lost uh, in time? It was lost, or, yes. Lost in uh, time. It, 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 you know, not every piece of instructions are necessarily kept for posterity. You know, if there was no rigorous record keeping, it may be that the historian, a hundred years later, has no access to that document, although it may have existed at the time. Yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, that's valid. Yes, you know, we can make that kind of broad right. generalization. Yeah, and, and that's all I was asking. Okay, well, let's go to page 59, sir. And <clears throat> No, I'm sorry, it's page 62. Okay. Uh, you're referring to uh, Mr. George Stuart McLean. Yes. And he had an acre. Yes. And um, do we know why he received uh, 240 pounds? Again, this is, speaks to my, my general assertion to say that it seems to be a lot of leeway. That's why I make the statement I make, because the cases I track out, 
there's no description or background to, to let me know that he might have had a castle on there. He could have had a business that grew more onions per acre than anybody else. We do not know. All right. It simply just says that he has a piece of land. I'm not sure if one description just says it was bordering. Yeah, it's bordering Benedict Priest. That was another white gentleman who has a neighboring piece of land there. And they are both, I believe, in Hamilton Parish area, Hamilton Parish area. But unfortunately, without the guidance of a map, because again, I solicited the archives. And once again, shout out to the very helpful staff of the Bermuda Archives, Ms. Carla Engelman and others who were very helpful in trying to help me track down these things because some of the same questions right. you're asking, I'm seeking to find out as well too as a historian because I wanted to know was there a map of some of these here and the Bermuda Development Company was very, it's very interesting. They seem to have more maps after it becomes their property and they start adjudicating it in the process of it becoming the golf course and mid ocean club. And prior to that moment, it seems to be less, at least in terms of the records that I looked at, it well, seems to be far know. less, you know, descriptive and mapped out um, information. However, it's interesting though, to your point about lost in the Washington history, um, just a side note, and I think it might even be useful for the commission is that when they submitted, when Furnace Withy submitted the Bermuda Development Company Act, the very first one, which was eventually split into two, two acts, the corporation and then the compulsory purchase one. When they submitted that, at the end of it, they say attached to this petition is a map with little colored areas of Bermuda to depict the area that they wanted to lay claim to. And such and such as we did in the archive, and we sent numerous requests, and they, they put in a solid effort, so I'm not upset at them. But to your point, it seems to be lost to history, or if it's not lost to archival history, it may be what I what I assume as a historian, just conjecture as a historian, it might be in someone's private papers, right? Like a family private right. papers being held versus Bermuda Development Company Act stuff. And, you know, the amount of wealthy families who were associated with this land and with this land acquisition or this land grab, however you want to characterize it, um, are numerous. So we'd have to chase a number of leads, which is the challenge of doing this kind of history. All right. Uh, on page 62, mm. you made the point, um, and, and we are taking it from the case of Mr. Priyuth, mm. that BDC representatives, to the extent mm. we can recapture of what yes. happened, they were clearly authorized to include compensation in their offers in addition yes. to the pure life. So that was a factor. Yes, it, it was a factor, yes. Right. But All again, right. too, that's the challenging piece about how that compensation is determined. And back to your point about whether it is based on arable land, usable businesses, um, large buildings, small buildings. We don't have a very specific record to say how that should be assessed. And, and, and in fairness, doesn't that simply demonstrate how very, very difficult it is to look 100 years back and determine what, is the val what was the value of the land at that time? I mean, as a historical exercise, it's just different. It's really based on what we're and what you're looking at. So as a historian, I'll say this. Sometimes it's quite easy because the records are right there. And depending on, again, the Again, just sorry to circle back to this theory, but it's such a compelling theory if you ever have a chance to read it, is the question about power, right? You know, there will be far more records about the value of items at Buckingham Palace, given the class position of the individual who lives there, vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, some other poorer part or less socioeconomically important part of England. So, you know, we, we have to just bear that in mind as historians. So to your question, how hard is it? it would really vary on the sources available. But with the sources available, this was the best work that I could come up with as was available in, in the Bermuda archives at this time. And this I'm is not the best record I can find. To be clear, I'm not critical of that. I'm just okay. simply saying, oh, you had a tough job. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work, yes. Not just a lot of work. At times, it's almost an impossible because the records are simply not there on what basis the various pieces of land were assessed. 
yeah, we just more so have outcome, but speaking to your point, we do have records in some of these cases, and that's what these pages are based on, right? But to fill in that granular level, to use your quote, to fill in that, that type of level of specificity in every one of these situations, it's challenging to do, right? And right. again, it might involve more time because possibly there might be a record that reveals that. The best I can go to is, of course, um, I believe I left it up there. No, not even I believe. I know it's up there for you. The Bermuda Development Company Act is there on the Dropbox. And there's a section of the Bermuda Development Company Act, if I'm not mistaken, which does tell them, you know, okay, um, if somebody has crops standing in the field or something, you know, you, you shouldn't just destroy the crops or something like that. But in terms of how these various assessments need to be made at a granular level, we do not see that. What we do see is we see a standard or a variance that's reflected in the decisions they make. Once again, coming back to the differences you see in how one person is treated, another party is treated, a third party is treated, et cetera, et cetera. We just see, we see variance, right? right? And we need to do our best to sketch together what that variance may be due to. You know, all things being equal, it might be because someone had more, more potatoes and onions growing on their land than the other person. Or all things being equal, it might be that the company was attempting to build, because that's the other thing you see in terms of me mentioning Dinah Smith. Her land is assessed at a far greater, her, well, her family's land, right, is assessed at a far greater level. And the best conclusion I can come to is the simple fact that she's the last resident there. So they really are trying to get her off the land, right? So this is this incentivization of black flight or incentivization of resident flight that they want to make sure these residents are out of the way so that they can follow through, go full steam ahead with whatever plans they have to redevelop the area into the type of segregated golfing um, establishment that they wanted to build, right? So we see a lot of variance in the ways in which this is being carried out. And it may be as simple, sir, as having a good lawyer or not having a good lawyer arguing your case. Yeah, possibly, yes, yeah. I mean, all of those factors are at play, most definitely. All right. of those factors are at play. I mean, but again, to speak to your point about, to speak to your point about expropriation and trying to set up something that is allegedly fair, but maybe somebody might be dissatisfied, you know, if the process is at best trying to be equitable, we should not um, bias it socioeconomically by saying, okay, who's got money for a lawyer on top of, you know, having to address the issue of there. So, you know, these are these challenges which come up in the context of these kinds of operations. Obviously, you are in the camp of Shakespeare, who suggested that the first people we kill are the lawyers. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. You know, you're Henry the Fifth. Hmm? Henry the Fifth. Oh, yeah, yeah. See, yeah, you guys didn't call me here for Shakespeare. Maybe Donna Smith, you know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Maybe Donna um, Smith, but um, <laughs> not Shakespeare, me quoting today. <laughs> all right. Thank you, sir. I'm obliged. I'm done, Judge. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you, counsel. Thank you, Miss Dr. Francis. I indicated that um, uh, Miss Pastor Whaling, who has standing, wishes to ask some questions. The Attorney General is here now, um, so I'll have uh, one of the he wishes to ask any question. In the meantime, I'd like to hear from Doc Pastor Whalen. Where is he? Did we organize him? This. <clears throat> Thank you, Justice, um, to all the commissioners and QC Whitehall. Dr. Francis, uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> good afternoon. I've enjoyed uh, your summary on Monday and today and your report. I notice in the report you, uh, which I think is a very excellent report, certainly has enlightened me a great deal. I know you 
make uh, a casual reference to the churches that were in Tucker's town. Mm. The Bermuda, uh, I mean, the British Methodist Episcopal Church and the Wesleyan uh, Methodist Church, of which the church I passed, Morrison, First yeah. United Methodist Church now, <coughs> um, came from. Um, and you mentioned just in passing that there was also a school. My question is simply, it's not indicated in the report as, best as, I, as I could determine, but in your research, I was just wondering if you were able to find any information with regards to the cemetery or cemeteries in Tucker's town. Mm -hmm. First, I guess that would be the first line of question. I had some others if, if, if you did find any research around that. Mm -hmm. um, with re yeah, firstly, good afternoon and thank you very much, Pastor Whalen. I appreciate your comments. Um, with respect to the church cemetery work, I would, did not have access to a kind of map to have a very, well, at least very specific maps to know the locations by which, you know, all of those um, cemeteries were located. Because like you said, there was the BME church, well, the Methodist church, which really is a legacy, of course, like you said, of Marsden and those early uh, preachers who were there from even kind of pre-emancipation time. And there was a British Methodist Episcopal church and as well as an AME church. The records that I found more, that I traced a bit more, was the AME Church uh, records. Um, Benjamin, oh well, Benjamin D. Talbot being one of the trustees for the land there. Um, there was a schoolhouse there. Um, I want to say it's Israel, uh, a Mr. Trot and a Mr. Simmons were, I believe, no, Smith and Trot were trustees of the school, but with respect to following the research on the cemeteries, no, I did not focus on trying to follow the research on the cemeteries. I really kind of looked at some of the conclusions that uh, the Ombudsman's report had raised, and I looked at that, but I tried to more so focus on, on some of the kind of families who were being relocated. I do have a petition, and I know I entered it into the Dropbox for the commission, dating from, I believe it's 1923, and I'm trying to find it right now as I respond to you, so forgive me if I seem a little distracted because I am trying to do two things at once. I'm trying to find this petition on my Dropbox, on the commission's Dropbox, whereby we had posted a, a petition from, yes, I think it was the trustees of the schoolhouse because they were asking for permission to relocate the schoolhouse because by, the, by 1923 the community had already been relocated and they needed to therefore remove the school and they were trustees of that school grounds. But with respect to the cemetery, sir, I don't necessarily have some solid documents on that. I'm sure I can find them within the group of documents that I have, but to respond to that right now, no, sir. Okay, thank you, because I was uh, just curious as if there was any uh, documentary evidence with regards to how the cemetery actually did end up uh, on the property of the golf course and um, the car route. Like I said, we did have a trove of documents, so part of that could have just been with my research purview and just trying to find out who carried out the land acquisitions. So I think that might have just been due to my kind of focus on the research purview, not necessarily on all the documents which were available. But um, if you do want to contact me subsequently, we can definitely have a conversation outside of this talk too. Maybe oh, I would welcome that process. Yes, thank you very much. I will offer that for sure. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. No, you're welcome. No, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justice. Uh, I do not believe the AG has any question for Dr. Francis at this time. And so now we will move to the commissioners, starting with Ms. Bins. Mrs. Bins, she will ask the first question. Mrs. Bins. Dr. Francis. Uh, 
Buddha raised uh, an issue yesterday, and um, it is noted from your report that there are several articles in the Royal uh, mm -hmm. and even proceedings of the House. Um, mm -hmm. how, how did you make yourself comfortable that the information that you were getting uh, via that source uh, were, was a reliable source? Um, and that your uh, report will not be uh, diminished in any way because of the accuracy of the information that was published by the Royal Gazette. No, great question, great question. Thanks very much, Ms. Dion. Um, I think as historians, one of the purposes of raising us, bringing a historian to, one, prepare this report as well as, um, you know, respond to that is this, a skill set of reading critically, yes? And by reading critically, that was one of the points that I was trying to raise in terms of sharing Bermuda's context um, in the 1920s during, I believe it was Monday's um, proceedings. We've got to appreciate that there is power disparities in between whites and blacks by reason of the existence of racialized segregation in Bermuda. We've got to appreciate that there are political um, authority disparities between the individuals who are being asked the questions and the individuals who are responding. So what I would often did was I would try and read these sources critically. Was there things that did not match the contextual realities of Bermuda in 1920? Yes. For example, if they have some story about, you know, this black person was able to demand from the white elite in this who's coming to see him this price and that price and everything just proceeded to flow too easily. I would be suspicious of that source and I would try and see if I can get some type of corroborating side story to support, okay, how does this play out later on? So it was not necessarily uh, a case of, oh, I found it and I reported it. I have a larger list of Royal Gazette articles and, um, and observances and pieces that I drew from the Royal Gazette, but we also have to appreciate, and I think maybe this is something that your question hints, but I don't want to attribute it to you, but it is a kind of mouthpiece of an elite, right? Mm -hmm. And even some of the quietude, which is suggested by some of the reporting of it, you know, that, oh, well, Joe Smith sold his land and everything was okay. I have to read that suspiciously in the context of a petition that was actually authored by the, the toughest time resident who were very critical of them being dispossessed, yes? So to your point about reproducing the kind of racialized or class or um, even power disparities that exist in a Royal Gazette source, which we can argue is a source authored by the dominant racial and political group, my best work was to try and read it contextually and be informed by the island's dynamics of social class, the island's dynamics of race, the island's dynamics of a limited franchise, and the island's dynamics of British colonialism. So the uh, conclusion that you reached, you stand by because of your, um, a lot of this has to be uh, uh, your own opinion on, because you, you have to form an opinion. Uh, you're comfortable with the sources that you've used, that your, uh, um, your report is uh, unquestionably reliable. Yes, um, but just to nuance that, I would say not as much opinion, but a conclusion based around the ways in which I adjudicated those historical sources which were available, right? Okay. Um, conclusions based on me assessing those, those um, sources. Okay. I am comfortable with this body of research that I have compiled. Like all forms of history, I'm sure if I was allowed another five years to research this. I'm sure I could find more or I could find different kinds of sources, but the core idea of there being power disparities between those who initiated, who carried out this land acquisition and those who were victimized by this or received on the receiving end of this land acquisition, I stand by. The fact that there was a level of off the public record dialogue, discussion, I don't want to use the word collusion because I know that's a legal term, but a level of discussion between the individuals who initiate this outside of the halls of formal government, 
I stand by, and there's record of that. I also stand by the fact that the British colonial government gives their assent to this, either through the letter of A.E. Bourne, as well as the actual colonial secretary himself reporting in January 1921 that the king has, you know, these orders on the BDC Act have been sent to England, and they've actually been signed off on, right. as well as Lord Milner. I have some records from Lord Milner, who was the colonial secretary. More observances of, of this report, I can stand firmly by. I okay. think those have been tested, and we have solid evidence for that. Okay, um, this is going back to um, the acquisition of property. Um, there was in the Bermuda Development Corporation Number Two Act um, the Commission's authority to um, create the vesting orders that transfer property from mm -hmm. uh, the individual owners to. Mm. Uh, uh, were you able to locate those records um, of the commission and uh, the, the actual order that constituted the vesting deed? Were you able to locate? No, I looked through um, I looked through the Bermuda Development Company Act general purposes folders one, two, three from the um, from the Bermuda Archive. I looked at hundreds of other documents related to that but specific vesting orders that said we have vesting this person's property into this other hands, I was difficult to trace. I mentioned the Dinah Smith example, though, because the Dinah Smith example, because she takes them, well, because she goes to court and fights them in Supreme Court, we do see a better trace of ours, the individual signing over their rights to the property after yes. this compulsory purchase, et cetera. We see more record of that, and I actually have that, and. I uploaded some of that to the shared Dropbox as well. Yes, um, I'm out of time. Uh, I can uh, circle back because I do have other questions I would like to put forward, but my time is up. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Francis, what I did not explain at the outset, commissioners have a limited time uh, to ask questions. And uh, so even though uh, Mrs. Binns may have more questions that you'd like to pursue based on your answers. Uh, she can't do that because her time is up. And I'm going to ask you to make your answers as succinct as possible, but obviously answering the question. The next person yeah, I'll call on is uh, Mr. Perrin Chief, please. Uh -uh. Yes, Dr. Francis. I See, in your conclusion on page 89, yes, sir. you allude to a comment made by Governor Ferguson in 2014 mm -hmm. regarding mm -hmm. this commission and the formation yes, of a commission, which he at the time denied. Mm -hmm. I also take note that uh, on page uh, 48, you allude to Governor Wilcox in 1921 giving his assent to the Bermuda Development uh, Company of the Day uh, mm -hmm. permission to, for the petition to be successful. Yes. In your research, what role have you found that the British government, the colonial government, played in these matters? Mm. Excellent. Um, thank you. Um, I found that they were instrumental. Um, short answer, obviously, Bermuda's uh, system of colonial government, its very legislature, its houses, its system of governance is endorsed or backed by the authority of the crown. The laws themselves, the Bermuda Development Company Act itself was forwarded or copies of it were forwarded to England and they received the king's assent. Um, the colonial secretary makes a notation of that and actually publishes the formal notice of the king's assent in the Gazette, and it's a formal notification, not simply an editorial. It's a formal notification by the colonial secretary in January 1921, and he says that the king has given his assent to this. So to speak quite plain, plainly, yes, the British colonial government does support or endorse this. Second of all, in one of my latter pages, I mentioned A.E. Bourne, who wrote a letter to His Royal Highness, uh, the Prince of Wales, 
expressing concern about this project and feeling like it, this project was not right. And that letter made it all the way to the colonial office. And Lord Milner himself issues a letter of response to say, well, since the local legislature has signed off on this, I'm not going to play a role in this. So we can talk about the deliberate activity of the colonial government, or as well as we can talk about willfully standing by when this was brought to their notice as a problem, at least by some Bermudians, one Bermudian in particular. Yeah, by way of uh, personal comment, have you noticed that 1921 to 2020 is just about 100 years, and we're now celebrating the 100th anniversary of that uh, land dispossession or mm -hmm. appropriation in Tucker's Town. During the interim, mm -hmm. you may also notice, and you can comment on it, that there has been a notable silence on the matter. And have you noticed or have you encountered any efforts to suppress either your investigation of the matter or your expression and assistance of this commission in the matter. Wow. Um, Julie noted that this year is 100 years. That was not lost on me, uh, Mr. Parentship, and I appreciate you raising that because I believe in terms of Bermuda, we've got to understand as a historian of Bermuda and the Caribbean broadly and the African diaspora, we've got to recognize that in Bermuda, we do have some issues with our historiography, whether it's the narratives about benign slavery or these kinds of progressive narratives that say just because there's some type of material productivity, Bermuda is benefiting. And without looking critically at the kinds of social injustices as well as racial discrimination that was existing at the same time as these times of so-called economic benefit and productivity, right? Um, as well as the kind of British colonial silence or British colonial deliberate action, which facilitates many of these activities to go down. In terms of resistance to <laughs> this report, I mean, hey, you can see, and you know, as someone who is in Bermuda, anytime there are discussions that might challenge a narrative of white benevolence and or co British colonial benevolence, you know, that always gets a bit of resistance in Bermuda by reason of the problematic history that maybe we have not fully addressed in the island. So that's all I can really say to that. But thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Francis, for your candidness. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Francis. Thank you, Doctor. Good afternoon. Uh, it's Mr. Starlin's turn. If you go ahead, please. Hi, good afternoon, Dr. Francis. Hi, good afternoon. How are you doing, Mr. Thong? Uh, good, thank you. Um, I have uh, two questions to ask. In the interest of time, I'll try to ask them at the same time, uh, but we can circle back if, if need be. Uh, so my first question is on pages 56 to 57, you mm -hmm. refer to the jury selection. Mm -hmm. and in particular, you refer to the BDC Act Number 2, Section 14 which yes, specifies that 36 jurors would be selected by the commission from the Smiths, Hamilton, and St. George's Parish Registers of Jurors. Yes, sir. And on page 68, you refer to Bermuda's electoral laws as regards mm -hmm. property, the property vote, uh, yeah. I think I can say. Would it be correct to assume that the parish registers of jurors was equal to the suffrage, the, the voting population, the property vote, and as such, would the jurors have been a, a peer jury of the Tuckerstown persons in question? And that's my first question. Okay. Um, to speak to that question, um, the jurors might not be exactly the same as the electorate. However, they would be very close, right? They would be very close. I'm trying to quickly rush and see if I can pull up the blue book as we're having a conversation. So forgive me <laughs> if I seem a little distracted. But... Um, in terms of your question, short answer, yes, they would be very similar. In terms of the second portion of your question, um, would they be peers in terms of class and racially of, um, of the Tucker's Town residents? 
Very likely not, right? Um, you do have some Tuckerstown residents who do have the franchise, and they mention that in their petition, yes? However, being that the Tuckerstown, um, the Tuckerstown residents are majority black and most of your electors are majority white, we're going to see a difference. I'm just going to quote you a quick little piece of stats that I have pulled up here. It's from the Blue Book, the political franchise in 1920 as recorded in the Blue Books. For St. George, for the island of Bermuda, you have 1,523 people who are eligible to vote in the political franchise of Bermuda in 1924. Of that, 953 are white, 570 are black. So these kinds of racial disparities existed in terms of the political franchise in Bermuda, and I believe they would be it is likely that they would have been reproduced in terms of the juror rules that they select from. Thank you, Dr. Francis. That's interesting in terms of the rule of law and juries. Can I, do I have time to ask my second question? Go ahead. Uh, quickly. <laughs> uh, Dr. Francis, uh, primarily because you as a historian, you've got me thinking about the historical context in which Tuckerstown occurred. And uh, not being a historian, I'm not sure if I have my dates correct. But I understand that following the Great War, there was a number of incidents, shall we say, in the USA, particularly in the South, in 1917, then into the Red Summer of 1919, mm -hmm. and uh, culminating in the 1920 Okui Massacre in Florida, the mm -hmm. Tulsa Massacre, Massacre in 1921, and the Rosewood Massacre of 1923, all of mm -hmm. which were focused on the destruction of black capital and largely uh, destruction of black settlements. Mm -hmm. I'm just making sure, do I have those times right in, in context of Tuckerstown? Yeah, roughly. Um, really, the major one you're thinking about, we can even talk about um, who works the one in, there's one in Arkansas, there's, and I believe that's like Elaine, 1917. You have another, like you said, the Red Summer, and the Red Summer is multiple racial um, uprisings by whites, oftentimes depriving black settlements or small black communities of land. Of course, you do mention Tulsa, Oklahoma happening in 1921. So yes, that is the kind of broader Atlantic world framing. If we want to look at this, what happens in Tuckerstown Afro-diasporically, yes, most definitely we can look at it in that type of fa fashion. And that's without even necessarily counting for the various types of colonial depredations which are taking place on the continent, such as in Gold Coast under the British regime and or in South Africa, right? Uh, thank you, Dr. Francis, for helping me with the historical context. Thank you. No, thank you for your question. Thank you. And now Mrs. Milligan White. Dr. Francis. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm interested in the level of discontent that was reflected in Bermuda at the time around 1920. So my question was, what was the size and proportion of the population in Bermuda in 1920? Mm -hmm. And where there sort of a broad spectrum of the population at that time that were against the forced acquisition of property or not? You mentioned this morning it was a signed petition of 24 signatures, 23 of which were landowners. Mm -hmm. But I'm more interested in a wider, was there a reluctance on the part of the Bermudian people generally to move in this direction? Okay, great question, great question. Um, thank you. Um, Here's the challenge, once again, with talking about this historically. I found a variety of, of various sources of discontent with this decision, various sources, from white elites like Laura Bluck, who writes a letter to the editor in 1920 saying that Bermudians need to wake up, that these companies like Furness Withy are going to come here and they're going to just grab up all the land and Bermudians aren't going to have rights to individuals such as um, A.E. Bourne, um, who writes his letter, and he's so concerned about things that he wants to write a letter to His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, right? He wants to make sure this goes to the very top of the ladder. 
and the letter is received by the Prince of Wales, or at least his administrative staff, and it's addressed and sent on to the colonial office. As well as the Tucker's Town Residence Petition, which we've mentioned already. The challenge about Bermuda not being a democracy, but being a colonial location, is not just to impugn colonialism just randomly. It is to highlight the simple fact that Bermuda does not have representative governance. Bermuda's population in 1919 is... So excuse me if I'm... sorry, is recorded as 18,994. 18,894. And 6,895 6, are white. However, because Bermuda does not operate politically, as a kind of representative democracy, we cannot gauge accurately to say how much is against this. With an electorate of less than 1,500 at that time, what we see is the individuals who are charged with Bermuda's governance, this elite group, they see no problem seeing this through because they themselves and literally members of their, their the assembly are invested in this project in one way or another from individuals like Sperling, who's in the house, from individuals like Watlington and Conyers and others who are in the house. So we have to just at least look at that and say, we at least can gauge a track of resistance or discontent with this at this time, and it's not just coming from Tucker's Tom. I think that's the critical points we need to observe. Good. Thank you. No, thank you. I'm going to ask my questions, particularly in context of your presentation and summary. Um, and without you sort of reiterating what you've already s said, um, in reference to the value of of land, commerce, and culture. In other words, some attempt to quantify it, which is, which is interesting because clearly we were, we've been struggling with that aspect in mm -hmm. the traditional sense. No, there is no book I can draw from that says, you know, here is how we're going to quantify cultural laws, here is how we're going to quantify the the extended ramifications of being compelled to move off ancestral property, because that's one of the points that I'm trying to raise. This isn't just a house someone owns. This is ancestral property. Dinah Smith's father dies in 1876. It's 1920, right? When she is finally being pushed or compelled to move off the land later on in 1923, 1924. But to your point, we do not have a specific way to calculate that. My report seeks to at least put human faces on the individuals and human stories on the individuals and at least try and speak to as best I can recover as a historian what their occupations were, what their context and circumstances are, so that yourselves as the commission can make an assessment to say, okay, what type of restitution or what type of address, redress does this entail for someone who has been living on the land in this kind of way and has been compelled to, to move and in the context of a country where your political citizenship is attached to the land you own. And that's a point not just that tough as Tom people make, that's a point that a white member of the House of Assembly makes. Um, Dr. Otterbridge makes that, and he says it's wrong or it's improper to dispossess people in a country where your very franchise is nested or rest within your capacity to earn land. So to speak to your question, no, there is no quantifiable assessment for how the cultural loss and the loss of place 
there's no kind of study on that that I was able to recover for Bermuda. However, my report, I hope, can point the commission in that direction to say, well, these are the lives that were lived there. These are the social contributions that took place there. And you do your best as commissioners to figure out historically what might be the best forms of redress for that, if any, is deserved. Thank you. I have one other question which sort of touches on uh, the aspect of the socioeconomic political climate of the time, and that is, is it possible and from what I understand, familial contacts as well, mm -hmm. represented a threat to the powers that be with their self-sufficiency. Mm. I mean, hey. And when, I, when I say that the, within the context of the success of how they operated without dependency on the, on the power structure at large. Mm, mm, yeah. Um, to your point, I think that is a very interesting point, and one of the things I try to do with the report is show the kind of ecosystems and sustainable communities that did exist there. I did not find a specific document to say that, you know, this particular person in governance found that to be a threat. However, what we can see is, and here's something to extrapolate a point just for your question, is this question of labor. It's always a question of labor that comes up in Bermuda, even, even to now, right? Do we have enough people dealing with labor? However, one of the critical things we need to think about is sometimes the labor shortages that elites are complaining about is the fact that you have some people who have self-sustaining, you know, local farms in their yard. If they have land, like a Takastan person might have, and they could grow vegetables. Sometimes black Bermudians in particular, staying out of that wage labor economy isn't uh, uh, due to laziness or somehow not understanding the economics. It's due to the fact that they earn land and they have other means to sustain themselves, yes? And one of the things you see even in the assessment of Takastan individuals and their homes is sometimes people, the people who are assessing them say, your house is unfit for habitation and it, it looks run down. Even Dinah Smith's home is negatively um, criticized in context of the Royal Gazette. Condition of her home, as if she somehow doesn't deserve money to, for the land that she's being removed from. But it does speak back to your question about the capacity for self-sufficiency. And was this viewed as a threat? Well, it's possible it would, but I don't have a specific document to point to. But what it does speak to is broader questions in Bermuda, such as labor and other factors which raise up. Thank you. My time is up. No, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Francis. And now, Mrs. Ford. Yes. Good afternoon, Dr. Francis. Good afternoon. Um, my question is around property evaluation or appraisals, as we know it which generally uh, an appraisal is orderly, a concise procedure to determine that word fair market value. And um, as you know, there are many different methods of appraisal, um, sales comparison, um, cost approach, income approach. And my question is, uh, was the same method used, for instance, for Mr. Gosling, was the same method used for the black owners of um, good question, good question. Um, it's interesting. It seems to dovetail. Your question, I really appreciate your question because it seems to dovetail with the um, council's queries earlier. The challenge is this, just quite short. You don't see a strategic um, set of rules for them to value, evaluate the land in the manner that you spoke to. Mm -hmm. So there's a wide variety. I do see instances, for example, where it is a white landowner, they get paid 240 pounds for an acre of land, and you know, blacks aren't getting the exact same amount. And we see that racialized kind of example of difference. But also just to add a new bit of nuance to that, we don't know, and it's not described in the records that I possess, whether or not that's due to the fact of somebody having a farm or someone not. But 
once again, contextualizing it within the framing of Bermuda, we can conclude reasonably that these background factors do play a part. You mentioned Francis Goodwin's Gosling's property. I was searching and searching for his deed. I even looked in um, his personal papers at, via the archive, and I was unable to come away with a deed for that. So that's, again, this, I don't know if it's lost or it's just in a family collection, not his papers, but maybe someone else's. But do we see a racialized kind of difference with the evaluation? Yes, with a caveat, it might be other factors as well at work, but is race one of the factors? Definitely, race is one of the factors you see in the difference. The other quick question is, it was determined by the powers that be at that time that that Tucker's Town property was going to be used primarily to develop or for tourism. Now, it seems mm -hmm. that Tucker's Town was a thriving, self-sufficient community, growing their vegetables mm -hmm. to feed their families and may sell some of those produce to the locals. There were maybe mm -hmm. a few that maybe did for export. And mm -hmm. so uh, quite a large uh, acres of land were, were, was purchased, but not all was developed. And I was just wondering uh, who holds, or where are the remaining acres, how? Who holds those lands today? Um, great question. However, the purview of my report, I'm more so focused in the 1920s. So I looked more so in terms of who was holding, who was acquiring those lands and who was purchasing them. Um, the Bermuda Development Company was the one who was vested to own those lands and subsequently develop them because they were even the holding company. Club and, you know, resort country club is produced when later on Castle Harbor um, Hotel and golf course and resort is produced as well, too. And the fact that we must not lose sight of is you also have plots of land where vacation homes were constructed or plots of land for vacation homes were constructed for foreigners to come and purchase these vacation homes. In fact, the original plan was for members of the Mid-Ocean Club only to be able to purchase land there. And I have the Mid-Ocean Club tourism booklet, I believe it's from 1924, that enumerates the specifics of how that goes on. One of the lingering questions though, and that was in some documents I saw going into the late 20s and 30s, was questions about were they actually allowed to resell all of the land that they had gotten by compulsion? That was a question that comes up, and you see that in exchanges between uh, Bermuda Development Company officials and members of the Bermuda government, such as Colonial Secretary, the governor, and others. That's a common conversation. But I did not trace this all the way to present day. That, that's a larger historical project. I, I love it. If you'd like to bring me back for a longer time period, <laughs> I could figure that out. But I was just <laughs> trying to work on the 20s. So I appreciate you, though. Thank you very much, Dr. Francis. Thank you. Thank you. Go question. Interesting Thank question. Thank you. Now I have a small gift of five minutes, which I'm ceding to Mrs. Bins. Mrs. Bins? Thank you. So Mrs. Bins is going to speak next. Okay. Uh, Dr. Francis, uh, just piggybacking on, just piggybacking on um, what has been said already about uh, archival silence. Um, mm -hmm. Is it possible, and I know you just alluded to the fact that uh, that's a project in and of itself to trace the very first transfers to present day status. Um, mm -hmm. That is a project in and of itself, and, and um, I just was just wondering if that is an undertaking that should be done, because uh, we're just talking about a, a period in time, uh, but it does not address subsequent events that puts us back in the picture of, about how the land was actually and how it's being used and who's holding 
the property mm -hmm. and whether or not there were any residual property that was not used for the purposes for which the companies were actually set up for. Also, mm. the entities involved, um, I know there were companies set up uh, to hold different plots of land at various times, which mm -hmm. uh, to an aggregate of uh, 644 acres. Yeah. Only a part of that was developed. Mm -hmm. What happened to the re residual acreage? Mm -hmm. How is mm -hmm. that um, being held uh, mm -hmm. present day? Is that, no. a, is that something that could be done uh, so that uh, it forms a part of the narrative, um, not just a historical aspect, but going forward? Just to no. let us know what's in the, you know, what do we have? Um, yeah, that's day. an excellent question. Um, once again, though, I think that's a little broader than, of course, obviously, yes. the purview of the report that, that I submitted. That's fine. But to your question, should it be done? Yes. As a historian, most definitely. Yeah. And as a Bermudian, most definitely. I think one of the challenges of this, um, preparing this report once again, but I took it on as a positive kind of challenge, and, mm -hmm. I, and I enjoyed it as professionally, um, is the fact that there is no solid kind of narrative that's very specific about this. We kind of know that the land got lost in Pakistan in a generic sense, but how do we trace that out? And I enjoyed doing this portion in the 1920s to get us mm -hmm. to that actual moment when this takes place. Um, but to speak to your idea, I think yes, most definitely, but that would probably be a longer term project. You would have to bring in multiplicity of scholars, not just myself, Dr. Swan, um, just countless other scholars to kind of build on this project, and we'd have to have a kind of ongoing team to work this out because that's a long-term project. Right. But I think it's a valuable project. Okay. I'm going to concede uh, some of my time to Mr. Stubble. Okay, Dr. Francis. Uh, thank you again. Um, mm -hmm. I have a couple questions. Uh, yes, sir. With regard to uh, the framework or structuring mm -hmm. of the overall development approach to the Takastan development. Um, is it safe to say uh, that it was, it became a template for Bermuda going forward with other aspects of a similar nature such as the railway and the um, acquisition of St. David's lands? Um, which are, you know, sort of expensive projects uh, in their own right, or was it co-opted from some other, dare I say, colonial jurisdiction um, and, and Bermudianized, if you will? Mm. Um, to speak to the first section of your question, what I do see is I see individuals like S. Stanley Sperling, being involved in the St. David's Baselands acquisition. He's there as a player in that process. I also see Francis Goodwin Goslin, who was involved in this. He's actively also a player in some of the decisions which are made in St. David. So in terms of is it a template as much, or is it simply an outgrowth of the oligarchic structure of Bermudian governance in the 1920s and subsequently whereby the same men of influence, you know, partner together to engage in similar types of activities based on the experiences that they've had at a previous time. We do see, um, again, like I said, some of the same players. So how much it plays a template. I'm not sure if I'd use the language of template as much as I'd use the language of the fact that because this is Bermuda and because we have the same kind of oligarchy of at largely some of the same men in control or their descendants or their good friends and associates in control, we see the reproduction of similar types of activity. And how much it is uh, represents a borrowing of other colonial systems? Well, we got to understand that Bermuda's administrators are borrowed from all over the British colonial realm, right? You know, you have governor center who've served in Africa or the Pacific or Australia and other parts of the world, or parts of the British world. So they bring ideas as well to this. So, but, you know, short answer, yes, we see a reproduction of this. How much it is a template, I'm not sure. But we do see a reproduction of some of these activities. And one short question, but just for the purposes of this hearing, 
um, and for the later generations. Um, mm. If you can just put <laughs> into context the Royal Gazette's rule uh, with reference to documentation at large, um, if you will, archi its archival rule, um, its rule in uh, public recording and mm. announcement. And for others who aren't necessarily from Bermuda, they might dismiss it as just a newspaper or they may assume that there was more than one newspaper. So if you can just oh. sort of crystallize the rule. Oh, no, most definitely, yes. It does serve a little bit as a formal, official tool of Bermudian governance. You have written in certain acts of parliament that when the act comes into force, it will be announced in the Royal Gazette, right? You actually have that written into some of the orders around um, the discussions of certain House of Assembly legislation or the measures that they pass. So it forms as an official organ. The colonial secretary, for example, when certain things come down, they make formal announcements in the Royal Gazette. So to some degree, it does form as the mouthpiece of the elite. I'm trying to find the page, but just to save you time, um, in my report, there is a section that I note as British colonialism. And the Royal Gazette editor at the time acknowledges that there's a lot of discontent, speaking to another one of the commissioner's questions, about this land acquisition in Takistan in 1920. However, he goes on to defend the British Empire and says, our interests will be protected because the British, um, the legal experts of the Crown will, refer, will review this first. So our interests will sure to be, be protected. So in essence, he's serving as a kind of defender or an apologist for this colonial um, land acquisition, right? So speaking to your point, the Royal Gazette does serve as a kind of mouthpiece for the elite, but not just uh, opinion mouthpiece, but it's actually a formalized document, formalized tool to announce certain types of political announcements, legislation, and even um, debates of the House are recorded in there as well, too, at one point or another. 